Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Splendor Forum. Thank you for dragging yourselves out of your tents and beds uh, this morning to come along. Anyone go see uh, Russ last night or Wolf Mother? Yeah, fantastic. Good, really good. The Foles. Very late. No, I think anyone who went to the Foles uh, was probably not here yet this morning, is my guess. That's all right. Very welcome to, to be here. I'm Dr. Sue Light Dreyfus from the University of Melbourne. This morning, we're going to be talking about the future of jobs in an artificial intelligence world. We have a fantastic expert panel this morning. Really very happy to, to have them here. <clears throat> we have Professor Uwe Eichling. He is the head of the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne and a world expert in artificial intelligence. He grew up in Germany. Uh, he has some interesting stories about salt mines there, which we'll talk about. He grew up in a town in a salt mine. He went to a school in a castle, chose his university because it was in a castle. It's a wonder he moved to Australia. There are no castles. Uh, and he has been the former strategic advisor on artificial intelligence to the UK government. Uh, and he has some great stories to tell us about the future of AI and what's happening in China in AI. We have Professor Jeannie Patterson, who's a professor in the law school at Melbourne University. She's an expert in consumer law. She says that's the boring bit. The interesting bit is her dad worked on the space mission in Honeysuckle Creek, having its 50th anniversary today, the space mission, and big celebrations of space next door in the science tent today. He gave her soldering kits for her birthday, uh, so she has tendencies in this direction, and she owned the first computer on her street. These are the important things about Jeannie. Thank you. And of course, living legend, Dr. Carl. Hands up for Dr. Carl. Yes, applause, Dr. Carl. <laughs> Author, science communicator, uh, has an hour-long show on ABC on Triple J, uh, which has been going on since 1981. The author of 45 books, the Julius Sumner Miller Fellow in the School of Physics at University of Sydney in his spare time. He spent two years traveling the outback, and he has been through 15 of Australia's 17 deserts, an important acclaim. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> he has been to Antarctica four times, and he's also most recently been to Tibet and Mongolia, which he'll tell us perhaps a little bit about. Um, if we might talk uh, a little bit to you, Uber, first. Okay. Um, the first thing I'm just curious about is a little bit of your background. How did you get into AI? What did you do to land here as a world expert in this? Oh, can I mention the salt mines again? Talk about the salt mines. <laughs> well, it's really... It's, so the village I grew up in in Germany, it's fantastic. We have castles and we've got salt mines. But the salt mine, the best bit is the long slide where you can go down really fast and you put some wax on your backside and then you go even faster. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ideal next thing for Splendor next year. We need a I think salt so. slide. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, I got into AI actually not directly because I, I in school I always liked mathematics and I wanted to be, I wanted to study mathematics. But my teacher said, don't do that because you get a boring job in an insurance company. So I didn't study mathematics. Instead, I studied business because then you get a job, right? right. So I studied business in a castle because the university was a castle in Mannheim. Very important. <laughs> but then I got a, I, I liked the business, but I always liked the mathematics better in the business. So I ended up doing a postgraduate degree in operational research, which is a bit like business and a bit like computing. And I did that in Swansea which is even better than a castle because it's on in the, the beach. UK. In, in the UK. In the UK, yeah, the university is on the beach. That's even better than a castle. And then you moved to Australia for better beaches. Uh, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Where are the castles? No, no castles, no castles. Um, so Uber is going to tell us today, for those of you who might not know, what is AI? Can you tell us what is AI? Oh, okay. So maybe this is the time we should get a few slides out slides. and help this out. Yeah, so we have I've slides. I've got a few pictures. I've got a few pictures to try and help explain that. He's worn his wooden bow tie, his you know, splendor professorial bow tie, to okay. tell us. Next one, please. Yeah. Here's a way to make the audience see the picture. Yeah. Right. Can you? Yep. Oh. Ah, cool. Okay. <laughs> maybe I'll stand up a little bit for this. Good. Okay. Well, the first thing when people ask me what's AI is, I say it's not robots. Because most people think about the movies, and I think about science fiction, and I love science fiction, but actually robots isn't really about AI. There is a tiny bit of AI usually in robots, because it's, AI really is so software, right? It's the programs we write. So that's the first thing. And then what is AI? AI is all about making better decisions. Like, you know, like we make decisions. 
<laughs> doing, some, doing something with less resources or optimizing something. And I, the example I've got here is my own PhD topic from 20 years ago. I was working with a hospital, and we had this problem of trying to get the nurses assigned to the rosters. And that's quite a tricky problem because different people want to work different times, the patients want con continuity of care. <laughs> you know, it's, and it's quite, quite tricky getting that optimal. And the doctors basically said, oh, come on, the computer can help. And then I came in with, can we do a bit of AI to help? And we did, and then we came up with this fantastic solution, and I thought, that's a great timetable for the nurses, and then we showed it to the doctors and to the nurses, and they said, ah, oh, but this isn't going to work, because this nurse, she senior, she doesn't work weekends. <laughs> right, so we had to go back, program again. <laughs> a few months later, we came back with another solution. I thought, no, this is really good. Look, Nurse X, not on weekends anymore. But they said, ah, oh, but that doesn't work, because you put Y and Z together, and they don't like each other. That, and that actually, the whole lesson from my PhD is still true these days. I mean, we can do a lot with AI, but we can't replace the humans. There's a lot of things, tacit knowledge we have, and we still have to do, decision support works, but the computer doing it by itself doesn't work. So knowing that nurse, you know, Anne versus nurse Emily don't want to work together, that's the human element. That's it. right, yeah. And it's not something you can code in a computer easily. No, no. Okay, so that was your, your thesis, still applies today. Yeah. Um, so, tell us more about AI. So may, maybe let's, let's talk about, I, I'll tell you a little bit more how AI works in the detail in a minute, but let's think of, think of a little practical example. How would you solve it? You know, imagine you're on a holiday, maybe in Byron Bay on a beach, or maybe it's a foreign country, maybe a foreign country is even better. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what happens, your credit card gets stolen, or maybe somebody makes a copy of your card. And you know, you get a message on your phone from your card, company that says, oh, we think you've done an unusual transaction. How do you think that works? Any ideas? AI? How, yeah. <laughs> but how, how do they know this is an unusual transaction? What do you think they do? Well, I assume what they do is just say, oh, normally you are not shopping in Fiji. But you're on holiday in Fiji. Surely you'd be doing lots of shopping in Fiji now. So maybe if you buy like a $90 dress at Kmart and suddenly you're buying a $2,000 transaction in a robotics store in Malaysia. Yeah. <laughs> so somehow it's some sort of anomaly detection. They're looking for a pattern maybe which is a bit unusual. Maybe if you spend $5 10 times in one minute or something, that would be unusual as well. Like so 10 coffees in one minute. So why would they spend $5 in... Ah, because usually what the scammers do is they try first if your card actually works. And, it, and you know, below $100 usually doesn't trigger anything. So they do a few quick transactions. And if it works, then the card is live. And then they might do the big one. Because the big one, everybody will notice usually. So once they do that, then the card's dead. Yeah. So the challenge really is, if, how do you program an AI to pick up the little transactions which are unusual, but not you buying a coffee? Because you don't want a message for that, right? Yeah. So... Yeah, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a little bit of insight later, but think a little bit about that. How would you do that? That's a good, good, good one. Um, uh, tell us about the next one. Go on. So I, I want to talk a little bit about this. So this is usually the most common confusion people have about AI. And there's, uh, there's another thing called what I would say automation. Mm -hmm. So let's try to explain what's the difference between them. If you understand that, actually, you, you have a big advantage over many people already. So, Automation is doing things quickly, being really serious about something, being rigorous, data processing in and out, like a car factory, you know, the robots in the factory. That's automation. There is no intelligence in there. It's just quick, obedient. Um, good example is the Splendor app. Have you used it? Well, you know, you can, you can, you can say which, which shows you want to visit, and, you know, it has a map in there. Mm -hmm. There's no intelligence in there, right? So it just gives you the list of your, the shows that you want to watch. And it says, oh, there's a clash. It doesn't tell you anything about what to do about a clash or anything. It just says there's a clash. Yeah. So that's a simple app which automates things, no intelligence in there. So that's automation. Do things fast, efficient, and obedient. Now, for me, that's not AI. AI is the opposite. AI is something, it's more powerful than me. It helps me. It does something creative. It does something unexpected. That's what AI is about. So it learns, it's creative. So for example, the Splendor app could be made with AI if, for example, it makes suggestions for you, like Amazon, you know. People who watch this show, they also like that show. That's a bit of AI. Or if there's a clash, maybe it says, maybe you should go there first, and then maybe you should go there later, or something like that. That would be a bit of AI. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? So might it learn from you picking yeah. five bands you really That's right. liked? And it would say, oh, you like techno. I'm going to give you suggestions for more techno. Like something like that, yes. Or maybe your friend chose that. Maybe you want to go there because, you know, your friends weren't watching that. Or, 
Yeah, or maybe last year, these are the shows you really liked. So this, this year, you maybe want to go here. Okay. Something for Splendor to do next yeah. year. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. All right. You want to go next one? So now I want to tell you a little bit how AI works on the inside. And that's just with one particular example, because there's actually many different kinds of AI. But there's one kind I like a lot. That's uh, what's called the evolutionary AI. So evolution, I'm sure you know, this is the sort of idea from Darwin, you know, survival of the fittest, you know, what's it all about? Eat, survive, reproduce, that kind of thing. So you're familiar with that idea, yeah? Cool. Next one. Okay, so let's have a look at how evolution solves a problem. And that, we will need that because that's how AI can solve a problem. And so here's the challenge for you. Imagine you want to hide a fish in water. Here's the water. How would you hide a fish in the water? How would you do it? I assume you just make the fish look like what's around it. Oh, maybe make the fish blue. Yeah. Water's blue, right? Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, how would you hide a fish in water? Any ideas? Suggestions? Make it look like the plant. Make it look like the plant. Ah, all right. Cool. Do you want to go to the next slide? Can you see the fish? Yeah. It's right. actually, I'm cheating a little bit. It's not exactly a fish. It's more like a seahorse. Can you see the seahorse? There's like a eyes and a, and a body. Maybe one more slide, and you can see it really clearly. That's what it looks like, right? So how did nature come up with this fantastic solution, how to hide a fish in the water? What, what a great way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, if we could get an AI to be as creative as this, that would be, that would be a real AI, right? So that's the, that's the sort of evolutionary AI I'm talking about. Get AI to design a leafy sea dragon. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, what a great solution. One more? Now, this has been done already. So people have done this in science and in engineering. And I want to show you an example. So just one more. We just, yep. Yeah. So this is a, uh, an example out of engineering where people had to design a nozzle. You know, one aircraft is refueling another aircraft in mid-flight. So it's a very difficult problem because it has to be very aerodynamic and it has to be very safe and it's a very tricky operation. And how and fast the, are they going when they're uh, flying in well, mid-flight? Well, there can be above, uh, light, uh, above the speed of sound. Wow. So okay. it's really, really fast. And the, the nozzle they began with is this, you know, a human engineer came up with this design and it works pretty well. But they were thinking, isn't that a better way of coming up with a nozzle, a more advanced nozzle? And the human engineers were trying, but it didn't really come up with a much better solution. But then they used the artificial intelligence, the one that works like the evolution. And look what that came up with. Next one. Whoa. They came up with this solution. That doesn't look like it would work at all. No, it doesn't, does it? And in fact, people are really skeptic, They're like, oh, this is never going to work. But actually, when you do the calculations, I mean, they use it in the practice, it works much better than the top one. And no human would have come up with this kind of design. It's really creative. So how did you come up with that design? Well, they used the evolutionary AI. They used an algorithm that does exactly what the, the leafy seed dragon did. It evolves over time. So I, I can show you how it works. Just one more. It's my last slide. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have an interlude here about this. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, sorry, I forgot about it. So imagine, <laughs> imagine you want to invest some savings. Have you got some savings, Sulat? Yes, a little right. bit. Right, okay. I work at a university, not that much. Now, I give you the choice, evolutionary AI or these people? <laughs> I think I choose the AI, take my risk on that. <laughs> tell, me, tell me why the AI is better. All right, I'll show you how the AI works. So that's my last slide. So... It's quite simple how this kind of evolutionary AI works. You begin by creating some solutions randomly. They're not going to be very good, right? But, you know, computers are quite good at creating random solutions. Let's say 100 random solutions, 100 ways of investing your savings. We're not really going to do it yet, but we're just sort of you know, coming up with something. Yeah? And let's call them the parents. These are our 100 parents. And then what we do is we produce another 100 solutions, but we don't produce them randomly. We take our parents and we cut them in half and we put them back together. Can you, can you picture it? Yeah, lots of children. Yeah, so now we have 200 people in our, in our population. And what we now do is Darwin. We say survival of the fittest. <laughs> we look at the 200, we keep the better 100, and the other 100 we throw away. Darwinism. Yeah, and you can do that again and again and again and again. And on computers, really fast. You can do this millions of times in minutes. And by the end of it, you keep the best one. And the best one is pretty good because it's evolved over time. Just like we have evolved. It's the same idea. Leafy sea dragon. Yeah, exactly. And that's how the nozzle was done. 
And I'm sure we could do the same thing for your savings. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah in, fact, no. in fact, I've done this in my work. So I work in, in uh, Nottingham University for a long time, and Nottingham invented the MRI scanner. Do you know this? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So that's the, you know, you can do brain scans and things like this. And we just had a new machine, the 7 Tesla. It was a new one. And nobody knew how to set all the parameters on the machine, you know, all the, all the, all the parameters and all the knobs. So the engineers tried, and they came up with something, and it kind of worked, and it gave you kind of pictures, but it weren't really very crisp. Mm -hmm. So we used the evolutionary algorithm to do it, and they set all the parameters, but one of the parameters, it set outside of the normal range. It went like to five, when the range should only go up to four. And the human engineer said, oh, this doesn't work, you, you, that's ridiculous. Mm. And he said, oh, come on, let's try it. And it worked, it worked better. And the MRI is used for good things and, like? And it's used for brain scans and uh, it's published in top medical journal and you now can get much clearer pictures of like tumors and things like this in the brain. So benefiting humanity, very good. This is fantastic. All right, come, come sit All right. down. And so I think that's, that's a really good introduction. One of the other things that uh, I'm interested in is music and AI. So that was something we chatted a little bit. Music, um, yeah. Yeah, music and AI, mm. very relevant here. So um, if AI is this good, can make nozzles to refuel between two planes flying at the speed of sound, why have musicians? Why not just have the AI generate all the music we listen well, to? Well, we've tried it. We have tried it. And it works, but not very well. You know why? Why? Because it's too strict, the AI. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can train the AI to, to learn all the rules. You can learn the rules of composing, you can learn the rules of the music, and then it will compose the music for you, but it will follow the rules very strictly. Mm -hmm. And it just sounds a bit anodyne, it doesn't sound authentic. And if you compare what the AI does to what the human composer does, the human composer breaks the rules sometimes, just in the right place and just a little bit. And, and, and we haven't been able to recreate that spark yet in the AI. Okay. You know, we can... The Greeks do that in their uh, buildings, like on the Parthenon. Yep. So if you look at the columns on the Parthenon, there's little bumpy bits. I do not know my architecture, but there's little bumpy bits at the top, and they follow a mathematical formula for it to get the, the shapes of the little curlicues at the top and bottom. And then they vary it just a little bit, as you said, so it looks right, mm -hmm. and they call this entasis or tension, where you add the human element and you think, no, that's not right, that's not right, that's what I think looks best. And then millions of people look at the Parthenon and say, it looks good. So that actually is a good segue to you, Dr. Carl. Does this oh, I'm not oh, worthy actually, of that one. I, we will come back for more discussion with Uber. Um, do you think that AI is going to put us all out of work, or what does the future hold for us in these things, in your view? OK. Um, firstly, I'm not an expert in AI. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in anything unlike my colleagues, Professor Jenny, Professor Uwe, I'm not a professor, I'm just a lowly fellow, which is pretty low. <laughs> so they're, they're full professors. So I just follow the expert opinions, mm -hmm. which I'm getting by learning what Jeannie and Uwe have written, mm -hmm. and Professor Tim Ma Ma Miller. Miller, Miller. And also, um, if you want to know more about the AI, what I've been doing is I subscribe to MIT Review, MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT Review one of the best universities in the world, and they send out this newsletter several times a week, and they've gradually shifted into AI, and you get this newsletter for free in your email, and then you click on the articles and you get them for free, and gosh, there's a lot of stuff. Mm. And overall, I'm, so, to, so to finish off, I'm not an expert in anything, but my summary of what I've been reading of what the experts are saying is that AI is massively overhyped at the moment, and if it does fulfil its obligations, we'll still have a job. And why is that? Why will we still have the job? There's a need for the human element mm -hmm. um, to be able to take you a little bit further, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. for example, with the music, mm -hmm. where you, um, they're not, they'd, anyway, they wouldn't buy the music either. Yeah, and, right. and, and as an example of the creativity, sure, there are works of art that have been made by AI, AI um, poems, uh, pictures, uh, drawings, and sculpture, and they have been sold at Sotheby's and have earned lots of money. For me, AI will be truly artistic when a welding robot decides that it wants to go to the beach and find its true soul. <laughs> at that stage, I'll say, God With damn, driftwood. you're real AI. But you, you, but you were talking about the, uh, I don't want to stop 
from Jenny. We'll uh, Jenny, but you're talking about what look like the generative adversarial network. So this is something I discovered mm. in the MIT review. G A N, generative adversarial networks, where you get one part of the computer to fight the other. So there was, with regard to the Oriental game called Go, there was AlphaGo, where they taught it every single game that the humans had ever learnt. And they got to beat humans eventually. And then there was AlphaGo Zero, where they taught it nothing except the rules. They just taught it the rules, and then this one fought that one, and they played millions of games against each other. And when they played the world human Go champion, they beat the human Go champion with a move that had never been thought of by humans. And everybody said, wow, that's way out of left field, right? So there's one example of where the GANs, if you let them run away, they can do amazing things. So one thing I'm really interested in is your view, because you are an expert in understanding s communication between society, science, society, and technology. Um, uh, last year, the first test tube baby in the world, Louise Brown, celebrated her 40th birthday. Um, and she talked about how when she was born into the world, people viewed IVF technology with distrust and fear, fear and loathing. They called it Frankenstein and were concerned about what it would mean ethically, morally, for the future of the human race. In fact, when she was born, the doctors ran 100 tests on her. And she said, if any of them had turned out abnormal, the world might have abandoned IVF technology. Now, the reason this is important is, since Louise Brown was born, more than a million IVF babies have been born in the world, a million, to people who really want kids. It's provided a lot of happiness, this technology in the world, despite all of this, this fear. In fact, the embryologist who worked on the case, Robert Edwards, also won the 2010 Nobel Prize because of his work on it. Are we at a similar place in society where there is a kind of fear of artificial intelligence taking our jobs, robots and Amazon, um, but actually the technology can be, like IVF, done for a lot of social good if it's done the right way. Exactly, I think it's a really good metaphor. And so to look at IVF, on one hand, there's a million people that have babies that have made them really happy. On the other hand, one of the strongest predictor of whether a baby will go into neonatal intensive care, neonatal means the first month of life, intensive care at $10,000 a day is if the baby was born IVF. So there's um, upsides and downsides. The advantage, of course, is that they end up paying more tax than it costs to keep them alive during that first couple of days or weeks. So we'll see the same sort of thing with AI, mm -hmm. and there'll be good and bad sides to it, and the pendulum will swing this way and that, and there will still be a way for the humans. I, I think people still have sex the regular way, yeah, do they? they do still I, have I, sex. I, I was really... I, 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 I did a story about this on... Triple J, and there were some women who, uh, there's a man and a woman who uh, had tried to do IVF and they couldn't get a baby, and they kept on trying, they couldn't get a baby, and then, um, and then the article said, and finally, comma, in a last desperate measure, comma, they had sex. Oh, is that how you make babies? Right, I forgot. So, so we'll, we'll see all sorts of hype and changes, and it can be good for humans, and an important background thing to realise is that some of it will be controlled by people with psychopathic tendencies. This is something I've come to realise over the last decade or two. So at some stage in your lives, you have or you will, you'll get screwed over by somebody and you think, why do they do that? And the answer is because they're psychopathic and they don't care. Nothing personal, it's just business. And in general, 1% of humans have psychopathic tendencies. Where they end up depends on a two-by-two two grid of how smart they are, smart or not smart, violent or not violent. And so the smart, non-violent people tend to rise to positions of power like running a panel or yeah. being a professor <laughs> at a university or a CEO or a politician, whereas lowly people like me... <laughs> yeah, but the point is, so that if they get in positions of controlling it, then we'll end up with bad things happening. Well, actually, this is just before we jump to you, Jeannie. Um, is AI, are the algorithms psychopathic, Uwe? 
Wow. I would say the algorithms are quite neutral. It's mathematics. At the end of the day, it's a bit of mathematics, right? But the data that goes in might be psychopathic. If you're not careful, you feed the algorithm with biased data, you're going to get a biased outcome. Right. Okay. So if your data says, um, you know, all African Americans are more likely to commit crimes, and you have an algorithm that says, oh, we predict then if you're African American, you're more likely to predict a crime, you've just created a... So, yes, now Jeannie's going to jump yeah, in. I can and you it. get that from the uh, Australian, which tells us that the people of Melbourne are terrified to go out at night because of these hordes of African terrorists, uh, who, refugees who are going around killing people and nobody goes out at night. Where, and the Victorian police say, no, that's not happening. And the Australian says, yes, these hordes of Africans are terrorising Melbourne. Jeannie, but sorry. I'm not sure the Australian is based on data. Oh, I, I do read the Australian every day just to see what the crazy people think. <laughs> Excellent. Jeannie has some thoughts on this as our resident lawyer. Oh, I was just going to say another a more immediate example perhaps um, in Australia was um, uh, Amazon developed a job predictor about who would be suitable to work as a uh, computer programmer or data analyst at their business and um, everybody that fit the criteria was a white man. Because yeah, right. that's who works as data programmers and computer analysts. So, so they were white Caucasian and male. Yes. And wow. the interesting thing about it was that the program they built did not search for the criteria of white man. It searched for the criteria of people who had the characteristics of data analysts that were successful at Amazon. It's just that all of those characteristics fit a certain group, which was white men, because that's who Amazon had hired in the past. So that the, the system actually sorted for things like um, plays, plays rugby, um, yeah. likes card games, possibly goes to strip clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, they just replicated their own workforce, but also ruled out all sorts of other people. Now, that actually wasn't the algorithm. That was simply the data that had been fed into it, mm -hmm. and nobody had reflected critically on what that might mean. And that's, in a way, the danger of over-reliance on AI to make decisions for us. Somebody needs to be thinking about the outputs and what the inputs might mean um, in the context we're using it. Um, is there a way to get AI scientists to think about that stuff, Uwe? Is that something that they're starting to think about now? And yeah. how do you train them to think so about that? Well, we're teaching all our students now in ethics. Digital ethics is really important. And it's, it's, it's kind of what thing a great where... topic. Yeah, <laughs> it's this thing where we, it's not just the algorithm, right? It's all the thing, what goes in, what comes out, and you know, what's, what's legal, what's ethical. These are all very difficult issues. Now, it's not, it's not clear yet what all that means to me. Still you know evolving. Still evolving. Do you, do you think that there are comparisons with IVF as a technology? I mean, today we've got regulation of IVF. If you want to do things like create five embryos because you want a baby and the first two take and you have two babies you don't want any more, you have three babies on ice and you have to ask the question, what do I do with them? Do I destroy them? Do I give them to a stranger? And there are processes that have been put in place over the last 40 years to meet some ethical requirements. Okay, so this is why I'm the most boring person on the panel. Um, <laughs> uh, in IVF is regulated at a state and territory level and the state and territories have rules about what you can do with IVF. Um, What's the biggest, what are the biggest technology companies in the world today now? What do you reckon? Who can name the biggest tech companies? Name a couple. Google. 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 Amazon. Amazon. Apple. Facebook. Facebook, right? Ten Tencent. 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 And you'll notice they're all companies that operate somewhere else. So now the power of technology is such that it's run by companies that have, have a global reach and actually are cited in many different countries. So if one country makes rules and laws, that's kind of irrelevant because the, the tech companies have a, have, have a, have a worldwide influence. It's, they're almost um, replicating states in themselves. So one of the challenges of um, controlling AI generally is to think about how we can do that when we've got international companies that are actually developing and running it and how we develop, um, think about rules and laws that can have an international um, effect. So we're thinking more human rights um, than we are sort of traditional road rules or even rules about AI, um, uh, you, um, 
Yes, yeah, so, th so there was recently um, the case of Facebook, which has a set of curators who go through and watch violent or um, you know, shootings, videos, and, and weed it out and censor it. Um, but that's obviously quite a traumatic job to have. Um, you need a lot of support. But I understand that um, those people who are working for Facebook really haven't had the kind of support they need to see those kind of videos every single day. Um, so what sort of protections are workers going to have in this AI semi-automated, semi-intelligent decision support but also need the human being in the loop? What protections are they going to have in the future? Well, it, it's, it's to some extent it's the same question, which is how do we put in place laws that protect the people that need to be protected when we're dealing with companies that flit around the world? So we need a degree of cooperation. And I'm going to answer the cooperation question first and the work question second. Cooperation is possible. Many of you will have noticed recently that Google has um, taken Viagogo off its um, paid ads to, so that it comes low down in the, um, in the, when you search for tickets, Viagogo used to pop up the top because it paid Google to pop up the top and now it comes down to the bottom. Does everybody know what Viagogo is? Via Giggo, yeah, great. So just for those who don't know, Dr. Carl? It's a totally fraudulent tickets reselling site <laughs> that firstly claims that the event to which you wish to go is practically sold out of tickets. Secondly, that there are a small number of tickets, usually at an inflated price. Thirdly, they will charge a booking fee of up to 30% of the inflated price and occasionally will sell tickets that are not tickets. And the artists don't get that money, by the way. So not only are they selling inflated tickets, but the money's not going to the artists. Anyway, there's been so much worldwide outrage at, at um, Via Gogo that Google has actually taken them off the search list. So there is a possibility of cooperation where, where you get enough movement internationally to do that. Does that mean workers' rights will be protected? Probably not, or perhaps it depends which workers we're talking about. So everybody's seen the pictures of people working at tech companies and riding scooters and playing pinball. Sushi for lunch every day. Eating sweeties, yeah, great work, so, well, sort of a great workplace. So work conditions if you're at the top of the order are great, but work conditions if you're at the bottom of the order are not great. And what's happening with a lot of these platform technologies is we're just developing a new class of workers who are in and a class of workers who are out. So there's a whole lot of workers out there that are packing your goods for Amazon, who are making the phone cases for your iPhone, or are reviewing um, the offensive material on Facebook. Now, our politicians keep going, oh, we should fix the algorithm that looks at Facebook content Guess what? It's actually primarily people who were doing it, people who were looking at offensive material and traumatised by that material and yet are basically being paid as, um, you know... Piecemeal garment piece, workers. It's like, it's like piecework. That's right. They've got no job security. They've got no um, workers' rights and conditions and they also have no um, a backup to help them deal with that material. So they're sort of getting secondary... Um, post-traumatic syn um, syndrome Stressful. disorders without having any protections about it. So mm. th there's an underclass with technology. There's a winning class, but there's an underclass. It's like the, what he calls technology, the fourth industrial revolution. And what happened in the fourth in industrial revolution is we've got great technology, we've got trains, we've got power stations, all sorts of stuff. Cheap cars. And we also had kids working in factories <laughs> <laughs> until we made laws about it. So uh, I, I think about the example of, I think it's the Amazon um, warehouses where the height of the shelving is going to be redesigned to accommodate robots, but humans will still have to interact with it. Unfortunately, they'll be crouching down doing their backs in the process. Does that mean we're being enslaved by the technology? Mm. Good question. Yeah. I mean, can I, can I bring up my typical barbecue question around this? This is about self-driving cars and the AI in the car. Good. And, you know, the AI detects there's going to be an accident. And either you're going to hit a pedestrian or you're going to swerve and they hit the wall and then you're going to hurt the driver. What, what should the AI do? Hurt the pedestrian or hurt the driver? And how do we resolve these things? And so how do we? I mean, is it, is it a question of there needs to be one godlike ethics panel for, you know, the lawmakers? I'm going to jump in here, though, and say that is a big question, 
But people in cars also, I think it, this, is, this is the good side and the bad side of AI. Actually, people in cars injure people a lot. So, so let, uh, we need to think about what the self-driving car does, but we also need to think about the benefits that we may get from mm -hmm. self-driving cars. So now I'm switching sides from AI companies <laughs> are, you know, like... Um, <laughs> factory <laughs> owners in Victoria, England, um, to actually, well, you know, AI has advantages because it does some things better than people. Yeah, but how, what, what about, the, let's say, should the AI think about the age of the pedestrian and the age of the driver? What's ethical here? Okay, okay. let me give you my slam. The normal thing for humans is that if we want to trans uh, transport our meat bags around planet Earth, we use our legs. If there is a technology that gives you an advantage, then you should also suffer the penalty. The person who benefits extra over just walking on their legs should also be the person who then suffers if something goes wrong. So the car should smash itself into a wall, um, killing its uh, load and leave the pedestrians unharmed. That, that, that's one way of looking at it, and I'm not an ethicist, so I don't yeah. know. Got some applause there for that one. So would you... <laughs> yeah. Jeannie, what but do you reckon? Good, you're, yeah. you're a lawyer person. Uh, uh, I'm happy with that. I, I like the fact that Uwe's... Uwe is teaching this to his yeah. students. I That's mean, Dr. Carl, I... would you buy the car where the salesperson says, and by the way, the car's going to drive you into the wall? <laughs> <laughs> you... Yeah. It all depends on how many airbags <laughs> there are in the car and how good the seatbelts are. So, but isn't, in a sense driving into the wall what most of us do today anyway? Yeah, so but that's, you're because driving we, down. that's because we decide to do it, right? That's different, yeah. isn't it? But our instincts as human beings, I mean, you're driving down, you see a pedestrian who walks in the street, and there is a wall, what do you instinctively do? How many of you here are going to instinctively go, uh, I might hit the tree or I might hit the wall, I'm going to drive over the pedestrian, hands up. Yeah, see, most of the humans in the room wouldn't actually, their instinctive is to swerve away from the human. So is it a question then just of, companies making a decision about how that AI should be programmed and how it could best be marketed. You know, there was a, and, and actually it's a good comparison with the advancement of the SUVs, the big cars as they were being developed. There was an article about them when they first became popular saying F SUVs and, and safety, um, which is, you know, uh, please buy this car so you can save my child and sacrifice yours. The idea that you're driving the big car, and if you hit the small car, someone else's child will die in the back seat instead of yours in the big tank. So maybe it's a bit of an extension of that evolving technology. Um, I don't know that there are easy answers to it. What do you teach the students to at least think about it? Yes, and, and you know, just to think about what, what data you would need, what, how do you make a, a balanced solution in this, and uh, think about uh, not just the law, but also the ethics. There's two different issues, right? So another question I'm interested in is you were um, working in China for mm -hmm. a number of years. Uh, what, why did you go to China in the first place to work and what did you discover when you got there? So, so I was in England at the time and I heard all this stuff going on in China, AI, China's investing big in AI. I just wanted to see what's going on there. So I went to near Shanghai for a couple of years and I worked there just to see for myself what exactly is going on in China. And what did you find they were doing in AI? Uh, there's armies of people working on AI in China. They're investing billions and billions, and they're really doing a lot of work. But um, it's not the way I would do it. That's okay. what I discovered. And that's why I haven't stayed there for long. And so how is it that they do it that you would do it differently? You know my slide on automation versus AI? It's exactly that difference. So in China, it's all about automation. Making quick decisions, getting quick returns. There's a little bit of AI, but it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. And I like more the deep, creative AI. Mm -hmm. And I think China is very driven by economics at the moment, so the companies invest a lot and they want a lot back quickly. Uh, would you say short-term versus long-term? Yeah, that's exactly what the issue is, yes. Short-term AI versus long-term AI. So they're not really teaching the thinking part of it, the adaptive part of it, the evolutionary part of it. No. They're thinking about how can we just make the product produced faster, cheaper, easier. Exactly. So the other thing I'm interested in is you had an idea you've been thinking about in research regarding AI and pets. Oh, wow, yes, this that's right. This is such a good idea. All right. I love well, that goes, that goes back to a project we've done where we try to do a lie detector. So we try to do a, a, a standoff lie detector, we called it, which is basically point a camera at somebody and let them talk and through the facial features try and see whether they're lying or not lying. And we sort of, we sort of found we could do that. 
<laughs> but we hit a problem. The problem is it depends on the culture of the person. So, if, for example, I, I'm simplifying this now, but uh, a white Caucasian smiling, it might mean they're lying. But maybe an Asian smiling might mean they're shy and they're embarrassed. So it, it, it's not so simple just recognizing the features. We also had to think about the culture and the background. Mm -hmm. So we did that project and we, we realized it. And then as a joke, we said, oh, I wonder what would happen if we did it with animals. Would the dog smile in the same way as a cat? Or would, could we tell whether they're happy or unhappy? So we, we started working on this, where we tried to do a emotion detection in animals by looking at the facial features. And I, I think this can be done. You yes. know, is your cat happy? Happy? Yeah, is, ha, would you guys buy an app that said, is your cat happy? Hands up. Yeah, you have a I've got a, I've got to totally finish that project. Yeah. <laughs> or your dog, for that matter. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah uh, sorry. Uh, I'd buy a happy dog app. <laughs> um, in Japan, um, the way that people are taught to two word phrase sex eggs, in other words, to tell what gender the chicken will be, mm -hmm. is to follow somebody who is an expert. And you just go along and you look at the egg and the light shines. It's called candling from the old days when the only light that you had was a candle. So it's still called candling. And in this case, you shine a brighter light through the fertilised chicken egg. And so, and then the egg sexer will say, male, female, what are you looking for? I don't know. And then gradually over a period of time, the students, and they don't know what they're looking for, but they pick up something and they say, that's a male, that's a female, and they gradually learn this pathway without at any stage consciously knowing it. And the only example I can give is any of you who can ride a bicycle. You cannot describe what you do to ride a bicycle. If you've got a, you're t teaching a child or a nephew how do you ride a bicycle, don't fall off. You don't, you just say, they pick up something and we can't describe it. So would that be a fun project for AI? I think that's great. I mean, what I'm actually thinking about, the animal one, it would be really good to pick up things like if the animal's in pain, for example, because they can't tell you, right? So wouldn't that be a good application? Very good, very good. Helpful. Um, has applications, interestingly, I'm interested in AI in medicine. And this is obviously a big growth area. Is it a big growth area for jobs? Mm. And what, how is it being done? Maybe, Uwe, you can tell us a little bit about that. And then Dr. Carl has some views on keeping the human in the loop on that, which we'll come to after. Yeah, so that's actually, a, that's my own area of work. I do a lot of work for the hospitals in Melbourne. And we, we're trying to help the doctors make better decisions. By the way, my take on this question, will, will, we need, will there be jobs in the future? Of course there'll be jobs, because A, we need somebody to fix the AI, because it's always, you know, just think of the nurses, it's never going to work, right? Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, we're just going to upskill all of us, so we're going to spend less time on the donkey work, have a bit more time on the beach, and just do a better creative job. So back to, back to the medic medicine, yeah. so. Um, so we have an example, for example, where we, we have a lot of data on uh, women who undergo uh, treatment for cancer. And uh, we are trying to predict whether uh, they remain fertile after the treatment. And at the moment, some women remain fertile and some women don't. And the doctors don't really understand why for some they, they stay fertile and for some they don't. So we're looking at this big data set and we're trying to come up with some rules that will help the doctor make better decisions so they can be more uh, confident in, in the advice they give to the patient. So maybe they could freeze their eggs or maybe they don't need to. Or maybe they know at least going in yeah. what the outcome is likely yes. to be. So that's a really good example. Um, uh, but Dr. Carl, you have some thoughts about the needs for human beings to be in that loop. I had mentioned before, I'm involved in some research with one of the hospitals that is actually uh, tracking how doctors in the emergency department work. And in interviews we've done with the um, senior consultants there, they're increasingly at a desk with a set of screens and all of the results of the patients are coming in from the MRI or the CT scan or their pathology. And one of the doctors actually said to me, oh, I have to remind myself, don't forget to see the patient. Because the temptation is to just read the data and never look at the patient. But Dr. Carl, the example you gave before seems to, to suggest seeing the patient is really important. Yeah, so um, when you're studying surgery and then you go for the exams, um, you have what are called long cases, which you spend an hour and a half with a patient, you work out what's going on, and you then describe the examiners what the diagnosis is and the treatment. And then you have the short cases where you have a whole bunch of patients in a bed. Bang, 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 bang. And there's some person lying and one leg is up and the other leg is bent outwards like that. And you just turn to the examiners and say, I believe they have a fractured neck of femur, next patient. Bang, bang, bang. 
Either you know or you don't know. You look at the patient, you make a judgment. And so you come to a patient and you shake hands with them and they've got a really strong handshake. The sort of human that, is a, uh, that has a really strong handshake in our society is usually a tradie or a tradesperson. But the flesh is incredibly soft, like a baby's. What sort of tradie has a really strong but soft handshake? And the answer is a sheep shearer, because they get the lanolin from the wool, or a masseur who's always working with oils and on your skin. And so you say, what line of work are you in? And they say, I'm a chippy, which is Australian for carpenter. Uh, and then you then turn to the examiners and say, I believe that Mr Smith has cancer of the prostate because the only reason in general in a hospital setting that a male will take f uh, feminising hormones is if they have cancer of the prostate. So they've, they've got very soft skin because they've been taking feminising hormones and they're taking feminising hormones because they've got cancer of the prostate. So you go to the patient, shake hands with them, lot one, lot, what line of work are you in? I'm a chippy. I believe Mr Smith has cancer of the prostate. Next patient. You've got to see the patient. You've got to look, feel them. And, and if you look at a Chinese person, very low chance of having any cystic fibrosis DNA. White Caucasian from Europe, one in 20. And there's all these things that you get by looking at the patient and touching them. So, but do we want a world where you don't have the option of AI? So increasingly AI is being used in medicine uh, in the UK. There's a company, Babylon, it's got to deal with the National Health Service there, um, where you can get an app on your phone, you can get diagnosed by the AI in the app. You can ring and talk to a doctor. It means you don't have to drive to the medical clinic. You don't have to wait in the queue. You don't have to see the doctor. The whole experience has changed. And some people thought, oh, well, people will really miss seeing the doctor face to face. But it turns out particularly younger patients are fed up with some doctors being really arrogant or having the wait times in the waiting rooms and all the rest of it. So there's a kind of a mixed bag in that. I am interested a little bit in legal risk in this space. So I'm actually going to ask you, Jeannie. Yes, bring this on you. Do you. Where do we sit on that issue of risk from things like being diagnosed by AI or having decisions made for us by AI? Or is this area not really developed in law yet? Um, no, it's actually pretty developed in law. Um, so generally in law we talk about AI-human collaboration. So when they do tests in a lot of er in, in areas where they test doctors against AI, AI might be more accurate than the doctors in some areas, but generally we want to improve accuracy. So at the moment anyway, the best view seems to be that we combine the powers. Mm -hmm. So you use AI as almost a filtering tool or pre a preliminary diagnosis mm -hmm. to get rid of things. So that's not relevant, that's not relevant, that's not relevant. Here's some things that might be relevant and then get the expert to talk about, to look at it. And the advantage of that is um, that Actually, access to healthcare and access to legal services are pretty limited. There's limit. People who are poor don't get access to good healthcare in the same way that people who are better off do. People who are poorer don't get access to legal services in the way that people who are better off do. And ideally, this sort of collaborative model, we use AI to take an, to, to make decisions, um, sort of triage type decisions, actually should extend access to justice, access to health care. So if we do it right, the collaborative model helps everybody and spreads access rather than rules people out of jobs or comes out with the worst solution. But it's a matter of how we people decide to run that. And so what are the jobs of the future? How will we train for them? How do you learn so that you're actually going to be employed in that new world? Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the simple way I would put it, computing is like a new form of literacy. So, you know, we don't all have to be mathematicians, but we, know to, we need to know a little bit about numbers. Mm -hmm. So I think it's similar to that, you know, we don't all have to be computer scientists or even AI people, but we need to know a little bit about how it works. Mm -hmm. So you can either get somebody to do the job for you, or you know when it's a good moment to use it, or when it's not a good moment to use it. And so you don't need to train for four years in computer science? No but you need to take a little bit of basic programming. You need to have some literacy in math. Yes. 
And so should that be something that should be required in all schools to a higher level than you think it is? So our, our approach at the moment is we are training school teachers in Melbourne to be more computer literate and actually to be able to teach IT better in schools. Because I think that's the, that's the best way to do this. That's a, a really good, you might have some thoughts on that as well, Dr. Carl. Well, I'm trying to take a big philosophical point of view. So if you look at the Oxfam report for 2010, and this will then tie back to jobs, um, to equal the wealth of the poorest 3.5 billion people on the planet took 343 billionaires in 2010, but in 2017 it took only eight. All of them white, all of them male. Mm. So the concept of trickle-down economics where the poor people get the crumbs off the table is wrong. The money is actually filtering up. Okay, that's aspect number one. Aspect number two, because I wear bright shirts, um, uh, somebody at the airport, Mary, uh, coincidentally the same name as my wife, she's one of the security officers there and she always searches my bag to look for the shirts. We have a joke about it whenever I go through. And I said, how come I never see you in the afternoon? And it turns out that she is the working poor. She and her husband have two kids and they have three jobs between the two of them. She works from two o'clock in the morning till midday, drives out into the far western suburbs of Sydney, the poor area, and then sleeps until the kids get home. And then she looks after the kids until the kids get home. Then her husband, who's a car mechanic, who works a 7.30 till 6 job, he comes home, he looks after the kids. She then goes out and works at another job that night and manages to get a few hours sleep. So she is working two jobs. Her husband's working one job. Between them, they're working three jobs. And they're actually having to get assistance from St Vincent de Paul because even though these people are honest, they're not thieves, they're working for money, they're paying tax, and they're working as hard as they can, they can't work any harder, and I never see them in the afternoons, they still, in our society, cannot, because of the way that the society has been set up, we've, uh, they now are part of the working poor, where they're doing the best they can. So we've shifted from a democracy to a plutocracy where the laws are set up to benefit the, the wealthy, to help them make, get, get more wealth. And I think th in that background, we then need to have the legal system and all of us to look at the world to make sure that this doesn't get even more so with AI, where there's a few small number of people in their walled enclaves and the rest of us are just working like really fast and the gig economy, U Uber drivers, do really badly in terms of money and they, they seem to make a bit of money in the short term and what they're not making in the long term is the cost of the wear and tear on their car. And so they'll borrow a car from somebody and wear it out and if you factor in the cost of the car, they're earning on, of the order of $5, $6 an hour? Mm. So there's a social justice and I'll just quote the book Better Angels of Our Nature by Stephen Pinker over to you, Jeannie, about how the laws have made the world a better place. There's been discussion of a social wage in this context and it's kind of ironic because Bob Hawk died recently and Bob Hawk was really the engineer in uh, modern Australian history of the accord um, that guaranteed a wage to workers and, and certain rights. Um, is this something that you can see actually happening again, a new social accord in an AI-driven job world? I hope so. I think the nature of the workforce is, is shifting. Mm -hmm. um, so Uwe, Uwe talked about automation not being the same as AI. That's absolutely right. But automation is actually taking a lot of low-skilled jobs, the types of jobs, in fact, that Dr Carl's been, just been talking about. So I, I suspect the risk is that this divide is going to expand. So if you're doing... If you're doing um, Log firms. Law firms are really good examples. Yeah, well, yes, and so are accountancy firms and so are factories. So if you're someone whose job is sorting paper, so that might be filling in company charges um, or simple contracts or it might be doing um, simple bookkeeping or auditing work, that's the type of work that is already being automated. It's not clever, but it's fast. So those jobs are going. So we're seeing a loss of a lot of um, low-key... Um, clerical type work that can be done by machines and it's quite unclear what happens to those people that had those jobs. So I agree, I think the divide's increasing. What do we do about it? Yeah, we need to push for things like a living wage, 
Um, we need um, Centrelink payments to be enough to live on. And we need to think about people who are working in gig economies because gig economies sound so fun. Gig economies, yay. But gig economies are no job security, no job training. And if you listen to people like Uwe, um, Uwe, um, who, who, who they, sorry, I'm going around in circles <laughs> there. Um, if you listen, the types of jobs that we need in the future are specialist jobs, people who understand how technology works. We need creative jobs. Remember we heard that computers can't write music? Um, and we need caring jobs because remember we need people who can actually deal with people Nurses, to, to, to diagnose. Now, all of those jobs can't, those skills can't be learned if people are doing gig, working in the gig economy and don't have enough money to live on or are too tired because they're working so many jobs to develop those skills. Those skills need to be developed and they need to be valued and they need to be paid so that people can actually develop them. Fantastic. Yep, some applause back Yay. there for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to open the floor to questions. You guys might have some uh, questions you want to ask. Um, jump in. Yep. Do we have a bouncing microphone somewhere around here? Or just stand up where you're close by? There will be a bouncing microphone and hold it close to your mouth uh, like I'm doing because either you hear it clearly or you don't hear it at all. And uh, we can hear you but the audience at the back can't. Um, okay, so you spoke just then a bit about um, a living wage, so universal basic income, um, and also the idea of creative jobs and maybe nursing and caring and, and those sort of jobs. Um, it seems like it's that's a limited scope of, of how much people can actually do if it's like, oh, I'm going to be an expert in AI or automation so I can repair or advance AI. Um, or I can work as a musician or an artist or a nurse, um, an aged care worker. Um, there's lots of other jobs that will be lost. Lawyers, for example, um, over time, AI will probably take over that. And I also think in music, AI will probably eventually learn um, and learn about what individuals want and need um, and adapt our music to those tastes. Um, I've read a lot about that. Um, in terms of UBI, um, and what exactly how that can look and how that can take over. Um, is, there, is it plausible to think that humans eventually will have very little to do with their time in terms of jobs and therefore will have more time to go to the beach or play sport or spend time with their families? Um, and that's a reasonable way for humans to evolve and live in the future? Yeah, and th there's a good question related to that. I'll pass to you, Uwe. Was well, the, econ the economists did a, mm -hmm. a comment and they said, the problem isn't that there'll be too many, that they're not enough robots is the real problem, not that there are too many taking away our jobs, that we need enough of them so that we can live that life you were just saying. Is that something that you think is an issue? Well, at a recent uh, expert venue where I went, there was a quote that said, AI is the new electricity. Have you ever heard that? No. So, so, you know, electricity has really taken a lot of chores away from us. It's our slave, really, right? All the machines in our household. It's like slavery in a way, right? So, and AI is the new electricity, so you have a new set of slaves, or a new set of servants, maybe we should say. So, okay, just to pause there, there is actually a school of law scholarship that's actually thinking about whether it's wrong to treat AI as slaves and the rights that mm -hmm. they have. Just pause that thought. Carry on. <laughs> okay, so I, I think I sort of agree with you, but I think what you're missing is the bit about what's happening with the extra time. I think you're going to upskill, you're going to go to the next level, you're going to be even more creative or more inventive, or you're going to have time for visuals rather than just music or whatever your field you're in. I think that's what's going to happen. And I think the legal people would be similar. They can spend more time on the creative side of things rather than on the, you know, the fact finding, for example. So, so just on, in the law firms, can you tell us a little bit just on the detail of the contracts you were mentioning of how that transition is actually happening and what it means for youth coming into that profession who might have trained for it? Yeah. And so I think the question was really important because it's very easy to say, oh, human caring is important, human creativity is point important. So does that mean the jobs are computer scientist, nurse, um, uh, musician? I think that what we need to think about actually is to go back and think about what, what, what creativity gives to us and what intelligence is. Because we tend, and I know you're not doing this, but we tend to say, well, creative types make music and serious, boring legal types write documents. In fact, and scientists do maths, in fact, 
most of the best scientists are people who are incredibly creative people, as I'm sure you know. Most of the best thoughts happen when we're outside walking. So the danger of the future, there's two, two visions. One is we all end up sad and alone with our earphones on, working in a gig economy, doing pretty boring work, um, because most of it's been automated. And the other one, which is I think the one you're alluding to, is we come together. And we come together and use that thing that is human relationship, human synergy, to develop creative solutions to deal with problems that are happening to us now. So it's the forward thinking, the problem solving side of society that I think um, we could mm. see ourselves working in this collaborative way with AI. And in law firms, um, which aren't always great places, but can be, um, <laughs> uh, AI is being used, for example, to, um, to actually prepare documents. And it's not just spit them out and then the lawyers fill in a few gaps. Actually, the, the technology now, um, you put in what sort of transaction it is and it, it produces a document that's tailored to that transaction. And moreover, if you're, say, um, an artist or um, a shopkeeper or a startup business, you can, we now have technology, you can give it the contract, it will read the contract and tell you what clauses are missing and what you need. So, so it's actually adding value to the work. But what that means for lawyers is instead of seeing ourselves as people who just like um, reading and writing about a very narrow framework of things and effectively going, no, you can't do that, and no, you can't do that, and that's risky. Lawyers themselves need to change to start to think about how they can be more creative, more collaborative with their clients so as to create solutions rather than just give them a bunch of documents. But does that mean that there are fewer jobs for 22-year-olds yeah, who want to... It means there's fewer jobs for lawyers in the future. Mm, okay. Is anybody crying except maybe me because <laughs> I'm a law academic who <laughs> teaches people? Uh, yes, just down the back there. Actually, I should say, since I'm representing my university, just means the jobs will be different. <laughs> check, check. Okay, it works. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah. All right, so I have two questions, if I may. So one for uh, Dr. Carl, one for Dr. Jenny. So starting from Dr. Carl, uh, you um, already mentioned this um, interesting application of AI to play Go, right? The Alpha Go. Um, and you also mentioned that uh, at some point it made a move that wasn't expected by humans, so to say. So humans wouldn't do that, which to me uh, shows that it's some sort of an improvisation, if you like. So, um, and that is a kind of essential part of creativity, which is, from the other perspective, is at the core of science and scientific progress. So my question to you is, do you think it's possible or it's complete nonsense that in the future, uh, scientific progress can be actually pushed by the AI? And the second question for Dr. Jenny is, um, actually, when shall we expect uh, legislation that is um, related to the rules of ethical design and application of AI. I know that you're working on, 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 this, um, on this part, but when can we expect this? Thank we, you. We might think, thank you. We might actually put that first question to both uh, Dr. Carl and Uber as well, because you might have some thoughts on that too. But first. Um, I'd like to point out that while I am in fact uh, Dr. Carl, it's not a real PhD doctor, it's only a medical doctor, and really, as Professor Jeannie, <laughs> I am not worthy. Um, will the AI push forward scientific progress? Okay, two part answer. Part one, uh, two GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, in a recent experiment only a few months ago, were set together to learn about chess. Weren't taught any of the rule, any of the games. Only was taught the rules. Um, around the hour number 16, they spontaneously generated the Sicilian opening, which is the, fam which is the favourite o opening by practically everybody, except the current world grand master who uses a different one, which I've forgotten the name of, and they came up with that opening around 8.24, about hour 24, and then for various technical reasons the experiment was shut down. So I think... 
the, the, they haven't got to... So I think that we can, in fact, go further down that pathway. Uh, using AI to help in chess, and then the second part with science, we have major, major problems in science right now. 95% of the universe is missing at the big scale, the dark matter and the dark energy. Down at the small scale, only 9% of the energy of the mass of a proton is accounted for by fundamental particles and the rest is some sort of weird quantum energy that we don't fully understand. And the third big problem is the standard model which refers to the subatomic particles that make up atoms and it works really well except for the fact that it's wrong. And one of the things where it's wrong is where it says the mass that the neutrino has no mass and we know that the neutrino does have mass. So there are all these things that we're skating on the edge of and there are going to be big scientific breakthroughs coming through and I reckon given enough time, uh, my, my, my guess is yes, that the AIs will suggest things to us and even go down those pathways once they've been properly programmed like people such as Uwe. Well, if I can take two examples from my own work, remember the brain scanners. So the AI managed to set a parameter to a value which we didn't even think would work and suddenly we got clearer pictures. Okay, so that's advanced. But then I'm still puzzled by what's randomness and what's improvisation and the lateral thinking we do. Think my example of the facial recognition for lie detection and then we do the pet emotions. I, I can't think how an AI could make that jump between these two areas. So little random things, yeah, but the lateral thinking? Hard, hard. Okay. Um, the question was, when can we expect laws about... Yeah, can you whip that up next week, please, <laughs> Professor Jeannie? Oh, yeah, with my superpowers. <laughs> um, and my contract writing machine. And th actually, the answer, this is... I mean, I know we're all a bit cynical about democracy and the role of democracy, but go back to the Google example. The reason Google changed the ranking of Via Gogo was because, not because anybody made it, but because people were yelling. Um, musicians had a petition that said they didn't like that technology. Um, the regulators in the UK said they didn't like the technology. So there's only, laws are only made in response to yelling. The, the needs of big business and yelling. So if people care about this, they need to yell. Good answer. Other questions? <laughs> yes, just down at the front here and then I'll try and get someone in the back. Hey guys, uh, my name is Brad and I just wanted to uh, say just a real quick story and I have a specific question in regards to my career. So I'm 34, I work for like Kellogg cereal, M&M's chocolates, Devondale Dairy in finance and I'm kind of almost just going through like a midlife crisis now uh, because AI is coming and I'm seeing a lot of technology change, jobs are getting eliminated, um, working in finance, you think about debits and credits, uh, systems can do that, computers can start doing that, a lot of the spreadsheets, graphs, PowerPoint presentations, they're starting to not need human beings doing that and that's kind of been my bread and butter throughout my career so i grew up in the u.s you can hear my accent and over there in accounting if you wanted to get a cpa a certified public accountant um, you either were going to work in taxation or government but coming to australia education is quite important as i look at a few professors and doctors and so I've been wondering, like, do I get a CPA? It'll take a couple years. It's a lot of money. I don't know if my brain's going to be fully into it. Or do I go into a different type of career? Because I do want to make, you know, good enough money to come to fun events like Splendor the rest of my life. So I guess my question, essentially, I just want to give you guys an idea that I'm definitely being affected with some big-name companies working in finance. I thought I had a good career, but now times are changing. So my question, essentially, is... How, how do I go about like a mid-career change in the, in the life of AI? Do I go after a CPA or do those types of like financial jobs, not that you guys, you guys are necessarily in finance, but do I really more just go into computer science um, more than like a CPA program? And what level of education do you even get? You mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Professor Uwe, that you don't necessarily get four years of computer science but you should at least dab enough to know numbers and that. So any 
advice you have would be appreciated. That's a great question. Thank you for sharing that first-hand experience. Do you guys have advice you want to start and we'll work Well, as a, as a particular program we're running in Melbourne, we have something called the Business Analytics. It's a one-year master's program, which we actually try and combine business with different kinds of computing and analytics. And that's, quite, and that's for professionals, so that's not for people who just graduated from the undergraduate. So there are programs out there which are not that long and they teach you some new skills. But maybe my other answer would be what I ask any student is, what's your passion? Is your passion still in finance or is your passion gone somewhere else? Do something that you're passionate about. Okay, Dr. Carl. Uh, uh, what Uwe said, Professor Jeannie? Um, I think just before you start, there was a conversation you and I had a while ago that I think is relevant about the accounting student versus the student passion for philosophy. I think that's a really, do you remember you were saying there was an accounting student you knew of who really wanted to do philosophy? No, no, that was my son. Oh. He's not here, now I'm embarrassing him by talking about <laughs> him at Splendor. <laughs> he was, uh, he does not have a passion for numbers mm -hmm. and yet his school, school guidance counsellor, oh, I'm gonna get in such trouble for saying this, oh my God. Anyway, um, his school guidance counsellor said, do accounting. And we said, no, don't do it because you're not interested in it. Follow your passion for philosophy. I actually also, I actually also tell students that. I say, don't think about mm, the, the degree. Think about what you like doing and what your skill is and follow that. And the other one is look on the horizon for who you want to be like. Now, in your case, you've got a skill and what you're saying is, I can see I need a new one. So you're ahead of the wave, actually. You are ahead of the wave because you're seeing what's coming. Mm -hmm. um, so if I, I would take your special super, everybody has a superpower. Um, take your superpower, which I think is probably around numbers, and think where you can place that. It may be computing and it may be a different type of finance where, because yeah, I reckon auditing has got a short lifespan, but there's other sorts of finance that don't because there's still the need to be able to explain to people what's happening with their business finances. So oh. communication skills packaged with IT skills and what you're passionate about, what your superpower is, that's what I think the way forward for everybody is. And then I think I do have a bit of an answer for you. Um, and I'm feeling your pain because you don't want to be just thrown out at random age with no prospects of employment and a hostile government that's trying to drive the unemployment benefit down. I'm kind of thinking that what Uwe said was really good in that you get to expose yourself to some a bunch of things and hopefully, you know, if you're trying to have a family and a life, you don't want to go into a full-time degree right now. Well, I, um, and, and so there is an advantage with a short one-year course that gives you sort of like a mental toolbox which then, as Professor Jeannie says, should be incorporated with your passion, but quite realistically, if it turns out that your passion is 15th century Mongolian literature, your chances of making an income out of that are pretty low, and you don't know what your passion is, so I'm, I'm reckoning a mixture of both of what uh, they said. I'm just sort of stealing what they said and taking credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions? Anyone down the back? Yes, a uh, nice lady down the back there. And then the gentleman just next row. Hello. Hello. Um, this isn't a question. I just wanted to say to all of the young people in the room, please join your trade union. If you're concerned yes. about job yes. security, yeah. um, there's never been a more important time to be part of a collective. Just go, just Google Australian unions. And if you're already a part of a union, have a fucking conversation with one of your friends about it. Good advice. Yeah. Very good advice. <laughs> Applause the gentleman the just here. Forever. I just want to say thank you for your work over the years, Dr. Carl specifically, for your uh, contribution to our society uh, over the many years of your work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's my duty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we think of uh, out-of-the-box AI or artificial general intelligence, uh, and we're in sort of a, an arms race similar to the moon landing or the atomic bomb, are you worried that um, different countries or different companies will take shortcuts to get there first? Uh, and how far do you think we are from uh, out-of-the-box AI, so to speak? I think you're more qualified. Do you want to take that? Well, I, I can tell you now, and from being at the cold face of this, we are far away from this still, because things don't work. That's my short answer. I think there's a simple things we can solve, but the advanced things, it just doesn't work very well. And I think countries take shortcuts. China, for example, they're more after the short term, but I think that it will take them longer to get there as a result, not, not quicker. 
Is that because they're not necessarily doing it they're smarter? Not looking, no, they're looking at the fundamental issues. Right. But China has a combination of short term and long term. So in their space program, they've had a long, steady progress. And at the moment, the USA cannot put humans into space, and the Chinese can. And they intend, they already landed a rover on the far side of, this moon, of the moon this year. So that's part of their long term planning. And maybe they're hiding the long term planning from you, so you don't know what's going mm. on. So th the AI, I, I think that it's massively overhyped. And if you came to our biometric mirror yesterday, you would have seen a good example of where uh, people were happy to go for something that was said, that was put forward as, this doesn't work, it's fake. And they said, yeah, can we buy it so we can use it to scan employees because we are recruitment companies. But it doesn't work. That's all right, we'll still buy it. Mm. Yes, any other questions here? Just got, uh, I think there's one just down the back here and then one in the front here. If I'm missing anyone way down the back, please let me know because it's a bit hard to see with the spotlight in our eyes. All right, hello everyone. So I actually am an engineer who works in creative AI generation, so in music and audio and stuff. So, thank you. You um, are a job of the future. I, I am pretty lucky. Uh, so basically, I just want to know what your opinion is on so deep fakes and all the examples that we've seen so far with creative, oh, sorry, like generative networks. For instance, like might have seen videos with, uh, I guess, Obama speaking all these words when he didn't actually actually say them or more malicious examples uh, previously. So do you think that um, legislation is keeping up with or laws are keeping up with the uh, advancement of technology or do you think that maybe it's not perhaps a concern at the moment and we just need to do I guess research for research's sake because as we've identified it's really only in the hands of you know a couple of like big tech companies who are doing the most of the development and it relies on their goodwill to like not do bad things. Question for you Jenny. And also, do you worry that it will stifle innovation or not? Is that a trade-off if we regulate or make too many laws in this space? Well, I guess when we get to questions of deep, deep fakes and um, the type of advertising that can be targeted people and possibly influence selections, um, if, the if the stakes are innovation versus democracy, I'd probably go for democracy. Um, even good choice, good choice. Thank you. <laughs> even if I'm looking at you for approval, there's too late. But I think given your T-shirt, you're with me. Um, so, yeah, I think we do need laws. The, the problem here is, and this comes back to this collaboration point that I'm talking about earlier, lawyers and lawmakers don't understand the technology and can't. And you can't legislate or make rules about something you don't understand. And equally, you can't make rules about things where you don't know why we're unhappy about it. So this is an area where we need philosophers, lawyers, um, technical people, numbers people. Dr. Carl's. Dr. Carl, or obviously, to talk to each other to work out how we do this. Because, for example, with deep fakes, you can have technology that actually identifies a deep fake, but it's, at the moment it's kind of an arms race about who gets there first. So. We need to bring groups of experts together. This, this point about collaboration is, I think, really important here. That's probably a bit of a non-answer, but I think collaboration is the only way we will be able to respond. And also there's um, a lack of deep, of critical thinking now, but it has always been so. Uh, and when you're looking at a video where Obama is saying, I propose that we eat babies for breakfast and it looks exactly like him and it sounds exactly like him, you then have to use a bit of critical thinking to spend the time to then go and work out maybe this is a fake, then prove to yourself that it is a fake. But how can you do that if you are working one and a half or two jobs a day and you're part of the gig economy and you just don't have the time to spend on critical thinking because all of your time is spent trying to earn a living because half the wealth on the planet is owned by eight humans. Good point. A final question down here, uh, the, mm -hmm. the gal in the front. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, so thank you for the panel, it's been really interesting. I guess my question is about, so there was sort of a general theme through your talk saying that 
with the increased utilisation of AI, we'll have a sort of society that has, um, you know, very highly skilled, specialised professionals and then a whole mass of people who um, find it more difficult to get work or, or valuable work or interesting work because they're sort of doing these mundane tasks that can't be undertaken by AI. Um, sort of, so then creating a society where you have the ultra-rich haves and then the have-nots. Um, and then in making a change, if we're going to make a change towards that, it's always the, the haves who are making the decisions. So you have your politicians, you have your lobbyists, you have your professionals who have money, who, can, who, who are making all of these decisions. So when this becomes more disparate over time, the haves are going to become more protective of what they have um, and they're the ones with the power to make these decisions. So how are we going to tackle this moving forward as this becomes a, a larger divide with time? Fantastic question. Really good question. I might get each of you guys to answer that and give some summing up points. Do you want to start? start okay, start? Um, easy. Um, Chairman Mao Zedong said that power grows out of the barrel of a gun, which it does in some parts of the world, but we're... We are right here, right now, and in the Western countries, power grows out of the Parliament, the Congress, the Senate. How do you make sure it happens? Run for politics. I ran for politics in 2007 in the New South Wales Federal Senate. Did anybody vote for me? <laughs> no. And part of the reason was that it cost to get a 5,000, to get a 30 second ad on TV was that it cost $5,000 for 30 seconds on TV at the really unattractive time of 3 a.m. on a morning, and in fact even more attractive, unattractive on a Sunday morning after the ads for the abdominizer, the non-stick fry pan, and these amazing knives that never go blunt, <laughs> even if you cut through a shoe, but before the born-again fundamentalist gun-toting redneck Christians from Texas, and so we didn't have a big enough budget, and so we didn't get in. But I've learned a lot about politics, and I reckon that's where the power is. Why, in the old days, did bank robbers rob banks, because that's where the money was. So if you want to change things, become a lawmaker, become a person who understands the technology and can teach, or cut through the crap and go straight for the power. Become a politician. So just before we jump to Jeannie, an interesting point on that is I read an article a while ago saying that the major political parties had had a decline in membership over the years. People had abandoned them because, hey, they were pissed off with them, right? But the only way you fix that is by joining them and having voice. Shoot, Jeannie. Um, I'd agree, except I also think that there's, an, there's actually an environmental imperative. The two are linked. Like, you want to go to the dark future with walled, walled estates and people using up more and more resources, or do we want to go to the bright future? But the bright future is to pull back and, and have less and look after the planet. So. Hopefully we go for the bright future and it's the environmental movement that will drive, I think, a more ethical society. Nice. Uwe, final word. Or we Hold die. On. Sorry. Or we die. Or we die. Good. The alternatives A and B. Well, if I go for the old knowledge is power, so how do you get knowledge? I mean, we're trying to help with education, not just the university education, but also in schools. I think that's a very good place to start. And here. Yeah. But also, exactly. Look. It's never been easier to get knowledge yourself. So much good information is out there online. You go to reliable sources like MIT or maybe Melbourne Uni, and there's a lot of good information you can find for free. Just ed keep educating yourself. Very good advice. Um, so can I remind you, a bit of housekeeping, today Biometric Mirror, for those of you who are interested, is on, and you can be scanned by Biometric Mirror next door in the science tent today at... Uh, 2.30 and 3.30, I think, definitely at 2.30. Um, also on Sunday at the same time, and then also Sunday at 11.45 if you're interested. Uh, there is a table at the back there and some folks who are just outside around the corner if you are interested in the humanitarian campaign to bring Julian Assange home to Australia. I encourage you to go and get information from them if you're interested. Can I please thank our wonderful panelists with a round of applause. Great job. Great job. And Sulet. <laughs>
as before. 